Hello, and welcome to the second video for week four of Introduction to Cognitive Science. Last time we talked about the relationship between bodies and minds in general. How does a physical body give rise to a mind? Um, this week we're going to be talking about uh, the relationship between minds and the physical again, but we're going to be thinking about what are the borders of uh, the mind as it's realized physically, right? We might have thought before uh, coming into this class or before thinking about these problems deeply that the mind is in some way contained within the skull, it's inside of the brain or something like that. But today we're going to be asking questions about the extent to which the mind can be thought to extend into the body and even beyond the body to incorporate things in our environment, such as your cell phone, maybe uh, your computer, maybe Wikipedia on your computer, maybe even um, notebooks that you have. Can the mind embrace things that are external to itself, external to the body and beyond sort of the borders of the skin? Um, additionally, near the end of class, we're going to talk just a little bit about the possibility that uh, multiple minds may realize um, a larger mental unit. So we're going to talk about the idea that cognition could be distributed across different or several minded entities. So we'll get around to that a little bit later, but we're gonna start out by talking about uh, what's called the extended mind hypothesis. And this is developed in the article that you have read or are going to read by Clark and Chalmers. And I think this video will serve as a good presentation or introduction to this um, article if you haven't yet read it. So a key kind of concept uh, that uh, is important to this article is the concept of a cognitive artifact. So I want to spend just a minute talking about that. Um, now, um, you know, the first word we've been talking a lot about, cognitive, so we've talked quite a bit about what it means for something to be cognitive or mental, but we want to talk, um, too, about what it is for something to be an artifact. And you might not have come across this term before, but essentially um, this term shares a, a root uh, with the word artificial, right? And so what these two words have in common is that they're both about things that are made, things that are made by intelligent beings like human beings. Um, so uh, the kind of technical definition of a cognitive artifact uh, is offered by uh, this theorist Edward Hutchins, who um, is writing here in uh, an article that he wrote for the MIT Encyclopedia of Cognitive Science in 2001. This is a kind of uh, initial definition that he offers. He says that cognitive artifacts are physical objects made by humans for the purpose of aiding, enhancing, or improving cognition, okay? So this is the basic idea of a cognitive artifact. Again, this is coming from Hutchins. He is this, he is this sort of a pioneering figure in some of this literature, in this literature looking at extended minds and, um, and uh, distributed cognition, cognition that's distributed across several lines. So again, the definition is <clears throat> cognitive artifacts are physical objects that are made by humans, so that captures their artificiality, for the purpose of aiding, enhancing, or improving cognition. So these are things, devices, that help us think, basically. And um, what about these cognitive artifacts? So these cognitive artifacts may be located in a variety of different places, right? So we can imagine cognitive artifacts being outside of the human body, but we can also imagine cognitive artifacts installed within our minds, perhaps. Um, the Clark and Chalmers article starts out with a series of thought experiments that ask us to think about uh, different um, tools that a mind might use. So I'm gonna run through these thought experiments quickly to highlight the idea of a cognitive artifact and to motivate um, Clark and Chalmers' thoughts about extended, the extended mind hypothesis. So <clears throat> essentially all three of these kind of thought experiments that Clark and Chalmers consider involve uh, a Tetris game. So, um, you know, they don't say it by name, but I think that's the kind of example we can think about here. So you can imagine uh, someone playing a Tetris game. Maybe uh, your friend is playing Tetris and you're looking over their shoulder, looking at the game. You can't sort of control the way the ships are moving, but maybe you're sitting there and just mentally rotating these ships, these shapes as you watch your friend play and um, thinking about what kind of parts of the kind of substructure they can plug into, right? Maybe someone could ask you, is that shape gonna add, uh, fit into this hole over here? And you might be able to say yes or no, right? So 
That's one example we can imagine. It seems like everything that you're doing here, looking over your friend's shoulder, mentally rotating these ships, these shapes in your head, and um, answering these questions about whether or not they'll fit into various sockets, uh, is, is purely mental. Like it's all stuff that's going on inside of your own mental space. You're doing all these things with your biologically typical mind, right? Um, so this just seems like a straight up version of cognition. Uh, Clark and Chalmers then have us consider another kind of familiar case to us. So we can imagine a player, uh, maybe this time we take the role of the person playing the game, not the role of the person looking over their shoulder. We can imagine the player rotating the shapes on the physical screen by the push of a button, right? Um, so they push the button and they see the ships, the shapes rotate. I keep saying ships. Uh, they see the shapes rotate. Um, they could uh, use that method to see where the shapes are going to fit in to the substructure, right? See what sockets they would fit into. If you've played Tetris, I think you'll, you'll recognize that this is maybe a quicker way to uh, determine where uh, the different shapes are going to plug in is by just pushing the button and not sort of trying to imagine it in your head, right? So this is kind of the typical place, uh, uh, the typical example of someone playing Tetris. Um, we're supposed to imagine this person pushing the button. And now imagine a kind of third case here. And so this third case, in this third case, the button and the screen that the person playing Tetris is using are going to be replaced by a neural implant. So in effect, we're building a little screen inside of the person's brain and we're building a little button that allows them to rotate shapes on that screen. And all of this is accessible by conscious thought. So um, in this idea, the player can rotate objects on an internal screen simply by activating this neural implant. So I don't have to press the button anymore. I just uh, think to myself, okay, shape rotate, and I can see it moving in that way and see what it's going to plug into. So here we've just taken the Tetris game and moved it into the person's head. Sorry, that was some cat noise. Apologies for that. Um, okay. So back to these examples, right? Clark and Chalmers think we're, we're going to be, uh, as I mentioned before, um, we're, we're going to non-problematically think of case one as someone um, rotating a shape mentally. This is a kind of cognitive activity, right? A mental activity that the person is performing in this case, just rotating the, ships, the shapes in your head and thinking about them. Um, also, they think we'll be inclined to think of case three as an example of cognition, right? So in case three, um, we have built in a kind of cognitive artifact, but we built it into the brain. It may be the case that in the future, um, human beings make various kinds of changes, uh, build in certain kinds of design software to make them think better, thinking tools that uh, allow them to think better. Think about something like Google, Google Glass installed within your brain. That could be a possibility. We talk about that. There's lots of science fiction examples of that kind of thing. And it may be that sometimes we have these kind of cognitive artifacts added into our kind of biological brain. If we do that, Clark and Chalmers think we would be inclined to think of those um, biological enhancements as cognitive uh, processes as well. The things those biological enhancements do um, would be thought of as, uh, as, um, as cognitive processes. So what about case two? So case two is like the world as it is now, right? We can play Tetris in this way and press the button and make the, um, the shapes on the screen rotate, right? Um, Clark and Chalmers think it makes no difference that for you and I, we're pushing this button outside of us to make these things uh, rotate on a, um, on a digital screen, right? Um, that the fact that those are located outside of us in example two, or that they're inside of us in example three, can make no difference to their being cognitive. It can't depend upon where something is relative to the, to the bodily boundary that it's a cognitive process or not, right? Location just doesn't seem like one of the right things to think about if you're determining if something is cognitive. So they wanna say that all three of these are examples of cognition, but in example two, the cognition is extended. It goes out into the world and it um, embraces artifacts that exist outside of the head in the world itself, okay? So they wanna say, you're pressing the button to rotate the shape 
um, and gaining new information of how the shape fits relative to the landscape is a cognitive process. It's just an extended one. Okay, so that's what we're gonna be calling into question whether that's the case or not. So Clark and Chalmers think that um, the kind of externalism that they're talking about is not sort of passive. Like we might think that, um, you know, uh, our concepts depend upon their relation to the external world to have meaning. So an example uh, to explain this. So uh, we all, when we think of water, we think of H2O because we know like the chemical structure of water, right? Um, but years ago, like hundreds of years ago, when people thought of water, they didn't know that chemical structure, um, but they would have thought of it in a totally different way, right? They would have thought of the clear thirst quenching liquid that runs in streams and rivers, but they didn't know the chemical structure. So that wouldn't have been part of their internal concept of water, right? So our internal concept includes this idea of its chemical structure, H2O, theirs did not, but how is it that we're talking about the same thing? Well, um, what philosophers have said about this to try and explain how we're both talking about the same thing is that the content of our concept is not only determined by what we think, the, the sort of uh, narrow aspect, as I mentioned earlier in, when we were talking about concepts and thoughts, but is also determined by the broad content, which is what is out in the world that's being picked out by our concept water. So the reason that we um, are talking about the same thing that our ancestors were talking about when they lived hundreds of years ago and didn't know about the chemical structure is that we're both pointing at the same thing. We're both reliably picking out the same object. So in a sense, philosophers have thought that the, the content of our thought is determined externally by what we actually, the things we actually stand in relationship to the, uh, in the world. Clark and Chalmers mentioned this kind of view a little bit in the article, but they wanna distinguish their own version of externalism from this more passive conceptual externalism. So what Clark and Chalmers say is that their view is an active externalism. It in effect asserts the environment can play an active role in constituting and driving cognitive processes, right? So it's not only that um, these, the fact that these things are as they are in the environment makes our concepts differ in some way, but rather that the things out in the world can actually be incorporated and sort of used by our mind and turned into cognitive processes, okay? So like a notebook, uh, the, the, the button on the Tetris controller that makes the, sh the shape turn, um, a, uh, uh, you know, like um, uh, maybe like my phone storing information that I use, all of those things, like the phone accessing that information, the um, computer making the Tetris shape rotate, uh, the notebook uh, containing the information on the appropriate page, all of those things are in a sense cognitive processes that link up with this stuff in here and become part of my um, thought, part of my mind, okay? So these things are active participants in cognition, these external things. So that's the key idea behind the active externalism that uh, Clark and Chalmers want to promote, is they say that the human and the cognitive artifact together constitute a coupled system that can be seen as a cognitive system in its own right. So in the cases we describe, the relevant external features, Clark and Chalmers go on, are active. They play a crucial role in the here and now. Because they are coupled with the human organism, they have a direct impact on the organism and on its behavior, okay? So this is the kind of active externalism they're talking about where things figure in the kind of mental processes that uh, are taking place within our minds. And that is, again, distinguished from passive externalism, which I talked a bit about a moment ago. Okay, so uh, how can we view this, this uh, theory that they're putting forward? Well, in effect, um, the kind of model that we've been talking up to this, uh, about up to this point um, of cognitive systems, uh, that model starts at the sense organs. So the sense organs are the things that transduce information uh, from the external environment 
into uh, uh, neural language that can be used, like neural impulses that can represent things from the point of view of the mind. Um, and then, uh, you know, we have modular subprocesses, which, um, which perform small transformations on the information as it's passed along to system two, uh, where more, um, uh, more centralized processes end up taking place. I notice here that these are mislabeled between system one and system two. But the important point here is on the model as we've talked about cognition so far, uh, the skin uh, barrier is the barrier to the cognitive system. But on this view, uh, what it's going to say is that the things out there in the world, uh, those too can involve computations that figure in our own mental processes, right? And so, well, I think this is the case. Well, um, the thought is, right, that uh, just as we've been modeling um, cognition on these kind of like functional or algorithmic systems, this kind of transformation of symbolic uh, features uh, of thought, um, if we go out beyond our own minds, we think about like a computer, the work that the computer is doing, that is itself going to be uh, algorithmic transformation of uh, different symbols, right? So um, if what's happening in our minds is a kind of computational algorithmic changing of different sim of symbols to other symbols, then that's also what's happening in the computer. So why not, instead of thinking that, you know, there's this cognitive system in here and this other stuff going on out here, just think of those as one process. When I type into Google what I'm looking for when I'm doing a search and it returns information, that is achieved via algorithmic processes, just as my reading that information and understanding what is said is achieved in algorithmic uh, processes. So um, why not just think of these as connected and giving rise to a cognitive system that extends out into the world that isn't simply contained within the mind. Um, one important example that uh, Clark and Chalmers talk about to motivate this idea is the thought experiments involving Inga and Otto, right? Um, so again, this is in some ways akin to uh, the Tetris example from earlier, but we're asked to imagine Inga and Otto, um, and, and how are these two cases different from one another? Well, basically, um, Inga and Otto both want to go to uh, the Modern Art Museum, right? And so they're trying to think about, they have this desire, the desire to go to the Modern Art Museum, and um, they're trying to think about how to get there. Well, we're asked to consider Inga um, Inga is a uh, mentally uh, or cognitively typical individual. Um, she's been to the art museum before. Uh, she's laid down memories about the art museum's location on 54th Street. Now, um, having the desire to go there, she thinks, how do I get there? And she, uh, you know, in her mental map, brings this information to bear and figures out how to get to the place, okay? Um, or alternatively, maybe she jumps in a taxi and tells them, uh, you know, that she needs to go to 54th Street and goes to the place in that way. Um, so that's Inga's case. Now imagine Otto's case. Otto is uh, very similar to Inga. Uh, he has the desire to go to the art museum, the modern art museum. And he thinks to himself, well, how do I get to the medium art museum? Or how do I get to the modern art museum? And so here's the crucial difference between Inga and Otto. Whereas Inga is neurotypical and she can remember how to get there, Otto is suffering from Alzheimer's, okay? Um, and so that's a degenerative disease in which, um, in which patients uh, steadily uh, lose bits of semantic information that they have. They, they forget the things that they know, right? So amongst the things that Otto has forgotten is the location of the art museum. But Otto like uh, many people suffering from Alzheimer's, has uh, found a kind of uh, way to work around some aspects of his disability. And that is by keeping a notebook in, when he in which he takes down information that's important to him that he can rely upon later. So Otto um, doesn't have that memory embedded in his mind anymore because of his uh, disease, but he opens a notebook and he looks in there and he sees, lo and behold, that the Modern Art Museum is on 54th Street. So now he's able to hail a cab and make it there himself, okay? 
So how are these two cases different? Well, they're different in that Inga has information stored in her, um, in her brain somewhere that she accesses and uh, uses to figure out how to get to the art museum. Otto, on the other hand, has information stored not in his brain, but in this notebook that he reliably carries with him, that he always has with him. Um, and so um, that's the key difference. So what are the cases supposed to show? Well, in effect, uh, here's how Clark and Chalmers, um, here's what Clark and Chalmers think the two cases show. Clearly Otto walked to 53rd Street because he wanted to go to the museum and he believed the museum was on 53rd Street. And just as Inga had her belief, even before she consulted her memory, it seems reasonable to say that Otto believed the museum was on 53rd Street even before consulting this notebook. For in relevant respects, the cases are entirely analogous. The notebook plays for Otto the same role that memory plays for Inga. The information in the notebook functions just like the information constituting an ordinary non-occurrent belief. It just happens that this information lies beyond the skin, right? So the point here is um, before Inga thinks about going to the museum, that information is stored in her mind somewhere. Before Otto thinks about going to the museum, that information is stored in his notebook somewhere. And it can be consulted in the same way to guide action in the same way. So um, what, I mean, like, it just seems like this is a belief that is hailed by both of them. It, the only difference is in what mode is that belief stored? In one, it's stored in neurons somehow or in, in neural pathways. In the other, it's stored in a notebook. It's written in a notebook. But how can that make any difference to its being some kind of mental information, okay? So um, that is the Inga and Otto example. So let's look, uh, let's end by looking at a little more, in a little more detail, the hypothesis that Clark and Chalmers actually want to put forward with these kinds of examples they're using. So here's their thesis. Sometimes artifacts and other objects outside of the body can come to constitute part of an individual's mind. And the internal states, events of those objects can be mental states or events. Okay, so the point is this, sometimes artifacts um, like the notebook, like the computer and other objects outside of the body can come to constitute part of an individual's mind. How do they come to constitute part of their mind? Well, they do that by entering into cognitive processes. And when they do this, the internal states or events of those objects, like the internal state of having written the museum is on 53rd Street within it, um, can become mental states. That can become a, a belief, right? So um, that is the extended mind hypothesis right, that these things can be um, actively incorporated into cognition. Okay, um, so let's look uh, at Clark and Chalmers' argument for uh, this thesis in detail. I'm gonna break this argument into two stages. So here's the first stage of the argument. So what they say is that sometimes parts of the world, call them P, outside of the body of a cognitive system, call that cognitive system S, supply information that aids S in its cognitive processes, right? So think about the te Tetra shapeshifter, that helps S with, in their cognitive processes. Think about Otto's notebook. It helps, um, it helps S, in this case Otto, find the art museum, right? So this part of the world outside of the body, the notebook, supplies information that aids Otto in his cognitive processing. So some of these P's, some of these parts of the world are, first of all, a constant in S's life, right? Uh, they're always there with S. So think about Otto's notebook here. Otto never sets his notebook down. He never forgets it. He always has it with him because it's so crucial to him, right? So this is a constant in his life. <clears throat> Secondly, it's directly available without difficulty to S. Just as Inga can consult her memory to remember where the art museum is, Otto can just as easily consult the notebook. He's, he's become so accustomed to use it, that, using it that he can just quickly look up what he needs and uh, without difficulty gain that information and guide his cognition using it. Additionally, the info supplied by this part of the world 
the stuff in the notebook is automatically endorsed. Auto trusts his notebook um, uh, totally, right? Uh, in the same way, right? Inga trusts her memory totally. Uh, these are laid out in more detail on page 17. And I invite you to look there. But uh, remember, so what have we said so far? We've said there are parts of the world that supply information that aids in cognitive processes. Uh, and we've said that for some of these parts of the world, they're constant in the subject's life. They're directly available without difficulty. And the info supplied by P is automatically endorsed. Now, here's the crucial claim. If one and two are true, Clark and Chalmers say, then there is no difference between the info supplied by P and ordinary cognitive info and processes inside the head other than that the ordinary cognitive stuff is inside the head. So the only difference is um, between Inga and Otto or between any of these other examples is that uh, the stuff is in the head. Inga's belief is in her head. Otto's belief is in his notebook. Therefore, the thought is there's no difference between the stuff supplied by P and ordinary cognitive stuff other than that the ordinary cognitive stuff is in the head. Okay, so these follow, this follows deductively from these first three steps. And now here's the crucial point of the argument supplied in stage two. Therefore, there's no difference between the info, oh, that's a repeat of four. There's no difference between the info supplied by P and an ordinary belief, other than that the ordinary belief is in the head. But simply, a, but simply whether or not some information is located within the head can make no difference to whether it's part of S or not, right? Um, suppose, for example, that part of your memory were uploaded to a computer and you had like an antenna installed in your head that accessed that information. Well, those would still be just as much your memories, right? It doesn't matter that they're outside of your head, right? So it, it doesn't seem like it can make any difference to whether or not something's part of your cognitive system where it's located. Therefore, in these relevant cases, the information contained in the part of the world constitutes part of the cognitive system. So this argument is valid. Um, if we want to object to it, we have to object by uh, rejecting one of the uh, foundational assumptions. So that's premise one, premise two, premise three, or premise five. And I invite you to think more about those premises. I, I've got a handout up on Moodle where you can explore these and challenge some different of those ideas. Um, but I think that these are the key kind of components of Clark and Chalmers' argument. And it follows from this that the extended mind hypothesis is true. So in their article, as you'll see, or you've seen, um, Clark and Chalmers consider several different objections to this hypothesis. Um, so one is that it doesn't match standard usage, right? that our uh, use of the terms uh, minds or mental states has uh, historically been applied only to, um, you know, entities taking place or happening within a skull. I mean, to this objection, Clark and Chalmers say, well, look, um, maybe that's true, but uh, we've had to change lots of our terminology in the past to accommodate uh, uh, new discoveries of science. If we, if we weren't to change our language to uh, make this accommodation, that would be kind of like chauvinism that we're expressing. Just, I mean, we're used to, uh, you know, thinking of cognitive systems as being in inside of brains or inside of bodies. Um, but uh, that's just our kind of uh, usage. And we don't really have a good reason to cling with, to that if the arguments work. We should just abandon that standard usage and change what we mean by mental states. Um, Right, so that's point one, uh, and it's uh, brought further home in this other point. Thus, in seeing cognition extended, only uh, one is not merely making a terminological decision. It makes a significant difference to the methodology of scientific investigation. In effect, explanatory methods that might once have been thought appropriate only for the analysis of inner processes are now being adapted for the study of outer. And there's promise that our understanding of cognition will become richer for it. So not only you know, should we not be beholden to these old usages, but actually if we modify our usage, we may uh, come to understand cognition differently and that may be fruitful for um, future research. Another objection. Um, the thought is that the, uh, that the uh, 
the kind of beliefs in the sense of Otto's belief, which is something that's written in his a notebook, those kinds of beliefs, the external things are never going to be reliable enough or as reliable as uh, memories, such as memory, Inga's memory of where the museum is located, right? Um, Otto's belief is simply not reliable enough. Um, well, to this, Clark and Chalmers say, well, it's very reliable and Inga's belief is not perfectly reliable, right? Um, uh, right, um, we might suffer, uh, right, like um, uh, Otto, you know, typically has his notebook with him. He's always ready to look this up. Um, Inga can forget things. She could, you know, uh, get drunk or something and forget where the museum is. So it's not going to be perfectly acceptable or perfectly reliable to her either. So this isn't really a good objection, they claim. Um, another thing they claim is that Otto's access comes and goes, right? If he leaves his notebook at home, it's gone. Um, Inga's belief always travels with her. Well, to this they say, no, actually that's not correct. Inga's uh, access to her mental state comes and goes as well. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, she could uh, be drunk, she could be asleep. Um, a variety of different things could happen that could make it so that she can't remember. What matters is that it's there when she needs it. Um, uh, just going on along this theme, we might think that Inga's access is better in some way. Well, um, you know, that she's quicker to get to the belief. That may be true, but again, Clark and Chalmers say we wouldn't want to say that people suffering from cognitive defects totally lack cognition. So um, imagine someone had a cognitive deficit where they couldn't recall things as quickly. We wouldn't want to say that they didn't have those beliefs. And that seems to be like something like the situation that Otto is in. Um, another, uh, Some might object by saying that the processes of cognitive artifacts cannot be mental artifacts because they are not conscious to us, right? So think about typing something into Wikipedia and getting a search and getting an answer to your search. Uh, what Clark and Chalmers is saying is that that can constitute part of your cognitive process. But this objection says, well, no, it's not conscious in the way or it's not available to us in the way that a cognitive process is. Well, I mean, if anything, what we've been learning so far is that many of our cognitive processes, such as linguistic processing, for example, are not conscious to us either. So the consciousness of it shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't make a difference. Um, one last objection. Uh, some have suggested that our access to relevant states of cognitive artifacts is achieved only via perception, right? We have to look at the things, whereas our access to mental states must be achieved internally not by external perceptual mechanisms. Um, well, uh, what do Clark and Chalmers say against this? Well, they say, if you take this view, then you're just essentially begging the question against the extended mind. Because what we're saying is, the fact that we're accessing them perceptually doesn't make a difference. Um, and also they point out, sometimes I do have access to my mental states only externally. That doesn't mean that state isn't mental. So, uh, so for example, um, the way we uncovered how our linguistic processing worked was through experimentation. So I couldn't just look into my mind and determine how that functioned. Um, so uh, that suggests that it doesn't really matter uh, if the access comes externally or internally. And then uh, last uh, objection here. So cognitive ar artifacts, uh, Clark and Chalmers opponent might say, cannot constitute part of our cognitive system because they are too easily decoupled or inconstant. This sort of builds on some of the things we've been talking about earlier. Um, essentially, they have several responses to this. First of all, in the distant future, we may have detachable modules. We would probably still think of them as cognitive. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, another thing I mentioned earlier is that biological cognitive capacities can be uncoupled. So for example, we can get drunk and forget things or we can suffer brain damage and lose uh, part of our mental acuity, uh, sometimes only temporarily, um, recovering it after all, or after a while. And then also some external features may be more permanently online than some internal features, right? If Otto really relies upon this notebook so much, it may be 
um, even more uh, present, the information in it may be more present to him than my memories may be, which I can have a tendency to forget or have difficulty recovering under certain circumstances. Okay, so that's uh, an introduction to the article uh, that you're reading by Clark and Chalmers looking at the extended mind hypothesis. Now, the extended mind hypothesis is one of three ways that a mind can be thought to be with an environment. And I'm just gonna quickly run through these three different concepts so you can get a sense of some of the uh, theories that people are putting forward to uh, push you know, what we previously thought of as a kind of um, internal to the brain or internal to the skull uh, concept of a mind. Um, so these are three ways of extending the mind. So one of these views is uh, what's called embodied cognition. Um, so what this view suggests is that cognition is deeply dependent upon features of the physical body of an agent, right? Um, so the thought here is that the fact that we are, for example, bipedal, that we walk upright, makes a difference in the kinds of things we can think and the kinds of processes, uh, the kind of mental processes or how our mental processes function. So the idea is that aspects of the agent's body beyond the brain play a significant causal or physically constitutive role in cognitive processing, right? That my body is shaped like this means that there are certain concepts I can entertain, certain concepts I can't, means that I process, um, you know, uh, spatial information in a certain way. All of these might be up for, for grabs if you embrace an embodied cognition view. Right, so this pushes the mind out from you know, just being contained within the uh, skull to embracing the whole body and indeed how the body interacts with the environment around it. Another view is that when we've just been talking about the extended mind thesis, what this thesis says again is that sometimes artifacts and other objects outside of the mind can come to co constitute part of an individual's mind and their internal states or events can turn out to be mental states or events. So this is the extended mind thesis we've been talking about today. And then uh, a third theory here is what we might call distributed cognition or what is called distributed cognition. So I referred to this earlier and I'm gonna say a word about it after this, but um, what this thesis uh, says is that cognition is distributed or can be distributed across multiple systems. So some, sometimes these systems are all within a single head Right, so we can think of modules. It seems like uh, you know, the view we've been developing so far has suggested that cognition is distributed across uh, multiple modules that are, inter that are often working at the same time. But sometimes this view says, sometimes cognition extends across multiple organisms in a spread out environment, spread out both in space and in time. So I'm gonna say one quick word about distributed cognition and then we'll wrap up for today. So um, this comes from uh, a lecture that I usually have Bob Williams, uh, who is a member of the education department at Lawrence and the uh, only other, um, or, or one of the other main contributors to the cognitive science program. Uh, Bob Williams usually delivers uh, a lecture in this class, but I didn't wanna you know, bother him with the way things are all um, kind of screwed up this year. So I'm just gonna say a word about what he usually talks about. And I'm gonna point you to some classes that he offers that, where you can go to learn more about these idea, ideas. So um, one thing Bob is very interested in, or Professor Williams is very interested in, is the, I, this idea of um, distributed cognition. And, uh, one thing he likes to point out is that this view con uh, uh, you know, is in conflict with or in tension with what we might call a classical view. So um, in some ways the view I've been developing up to this point with you all is sort of a classical view, but I also think we need to push it out into the world as well. So what did the classical view uh, say? Well, it says, first of all, that cognition happens in this like, um, area that is surrounded with the red dots on this picture, right? Um, the classical view emphasizes internal symbol processing, right? So symbol processing happening inside of a brain or inside of the skull. Um, it emphasizes formal syntactic operations, right? So transformation, symbol transformations of one type to another, right? Um, in some cases, these might look like logical rules or something like that. 
that would be the kind of most formal syntactic operations. Um, and we're going to think of, uh, if we're classical theorists, we're going to think of mental operations primarily from this point of view. Um, additionally, the classical view might involve uh, reference to the world or possible worlds, but it doesn't really think of the world as being a part of cognition in any deeper sense than that. So uh, people have um, argued against this view. Uh, Professor Williams himself suggested a, a, a shift in our view of cognition from a classical view to a distributed view. And so a distributed view is going to emphasize uh, that people do a lot of their thinking in groups. And so this is an example of uh, some Coast Guard uh, um, uh, cadets mapping a route for a ship through a channel, right? So uh, you see them here working together, sharing information with one another to perform this uh, cognitive task of figuring out how to get through this channel. What does distributed cognition look like? Well, the location where distributed cognition takes place is out here in the world amongst people. It's going to be um, us, uh, our, our cognition might be distributed in the way the extended mind hypothesis talked about to incorporate different artifacts in the world, but it also might be distributed between different people, right? So if we embrace a kind of distributive view of cognition, we're going to think of cognition as distributed materially. So both across internal and external structure, right? So both within my brain and also in my notebook, right? So distributed cognition is certainly going to embrace the kind of extended uh, mind theory that Clark and Chalmers put forward where parts of the world can come to constitute part of my cognitive system. But it's also going to say that cognition can be distributed socially uh, across members of a social group. So here these cadets are together figuring out how to navigate this channel, right? Um, the members of NASA may know how, or, or you know, the people who work for NASA may know how to uh, build a spaceship that can make it to Mars, but no one person in NASA presumably knows how to do that, right? So knowing how to build that spaceship may be distributed across all of the members or employees within NASA, right? Um, so the distributed cognition theorist is going to say that cognition is socially distributed in this way. And then also, uh, another way in which uh, distributed cognition theorists think of cognition is as being temporally distributed. So um, not only do I realize cognitive processes with other people I work with that are here with me right now, but also um, we exist within a culture where knowledge is built upon itself, right? So I'm also in a relationship with people who have died generations before and together we are realizing uh, cognitive processes across time. Like uh, one example uh, might actually uh, help illustrate this point, it's presented by this picture. If you think about these cadets mapping this course through this channel, um, they're relying upon maps that have been built up over generations of how this channel, uh, the topography of this channel. They're relying upon methods and tools that have been designed by uh, previous generations. Like, so their cognition in some way incorporates the work that has been done by these previous generations. And that's part of how their cognition is distributed in this case. Um, so that is maybe the most extreme uh, version of uh, how the mind can interact with the world. Um, if you wanna learn more about that, you can check out, uh, as I mentioned, some of Professor Williams' courses. He teaches three courses. Uh, he, he teaches about one of these every year. Uh, so one is distributed cognition, which is really the one that's primarily focused on what we're talking about here. Um, another is cognitive linguistics. So this is a, a kind of particular view on linguistics uh, that um, thinks in particular about how our ways of thinking and speaking are embodied. We're gonna have a word to say about this too later on. And then the third is gesture study. So looking at the way in which our bodies uh, move, uh, moving about in the world, help us to learn things, um, help us to convey meaning and so on. So it's the study of gestures, right? Uh, this year he is going to be teaching this course, gesture studies, which will meet uh, spring term, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 1.50 to three. Okay, that's it for today's lecture. I look forward to seeing you 
uh, later this week. Bye.